So Emily Abendroff is visiting us from Philadelphia. Um, she teaches there at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, she's, this year, um, she received a Pew Fellowship for the Arts, so she gets the year off um, and gets to do things like this. Um, at the end of the year, um, December into January, she'll be doing a residency at uh, McDowell, which will allow her to complete some projects and begin some projects. Um, but so, just to give you a sense of um, who Emily is, um, maybe I should just say she drove here. Um, I got a ride with her this morning. Um, a few days ago I got a call from her. She was in South Dakota. Um, yesterday she visited the class, the program I'm teaching on imperialism. Um, the day before that she was in Seattle um, giving a presentation at University of Washington at Bothell. Um, and tomorrow she's on her way to Portland and then before long she'll make it to Berkeley. Um, she actually went to school at Berkeley, so there's a kind of circuitry there. Um, so maybe one thing to say is that Emily is somebody who travels. Um, she's been to El Salvador in recent years where she was involved with um, some community farming projects and writing projects as well. Um, last summer she um, took a trip of a slightly different sort um, with a bunch of organizers and activists involved with an organization called Decarcerate PA. She walked from Philadelphia to the state capital um, in Harrisburg. Um, I forget exactly how many days it took. The point of the march was to protest and invite the legislature to reconsider um, the amount of money that's spent on incarceration um, and to draw general attention to um, the amount of money that is not spent on education. Um, and so that's a, a different kind of trip that Emily has taken. Um, I think of Emily as an exemplar of praxis, as um, somebody who does things um, and gets things done. Um, she does this in words. She does this in deeds, um, and sometimes both in words and deeds. Um, she co-founded uh, an innovative prison education program um, called Address This. You can look that up online. The best way to find it is through the umbrella organization that it's under, which is called Books Through Bars. Um, Address This facilitates correspondence courses, um, particularly for prisoners who are held in solitary confinement, um, which is to say prisoners who don't have access to the very limited education programs that are available um, in um, the state of Pennsylvania. Um, she's centrally involved with Decarcerate PA, the organization that marched from Philadelphia to Harrisburg. Um, and she's also taught in uh, prisons in New York State through the Bard Prison Initiative. Um, I would invite you to look up all of these organizations to get a sense of what they're up to, where they're coming from, how they represent themselves, where they're going, um, what you might do relative to those projects. Um, but I also need to add that Emily is, in addition to all of these things, a writer. She's a writer of nuanced prose. Um, I would invite you to look at some of the newsletters um, associated with Decarcerate PA or um, Address This. Um, but you could also find online, and these newsletters are online, um, you could also find online an essay that she's written on the work of Miranda Mellis who teaches here at Evergreen. This essay you can find at um, an online magazine called Jacket 2. Um, but a lot of her work also appears in more clandestine publications, um, sort of fine, fine print, small, limited edition, small press um, publications like this one, Exclosures 1 through 8, Emily Abendroth, you can't see it in the back, but 
the name takes a little bend there. This was produced by Brian Teer, who some of you may recall gave an art lecture here last year. This is a publication from Brian Teer's press, Albion Press, um, also located in Philadelphia. Um, there are many other small um, editions of this sort that I invite you to seek out. Um, but earlier this year, um, her first paperback on a larger press, a more generally available paperback, um, was produced. Her first book, the name is Exclosures. It's published by Asata Press. The information is available on the Art Lecture website. Um, some of you may recall that a poet called Juliana Spar was here last year with David Book. Um, they gave an art lecture um, in the winter, I think it was. Um, and it just so happens that um, Juliana Spar writes a blurb for Exclosures. So um, there's a strange kind of conspiracy afoot in the curation of these art lectures. Um, and I think Emily is a fitting writer for us to launch the second art lecture of this year with. So please join me in welcoming Emily Abendroth to Evergreen. Thanks, Eric, um, and thanks so much for having me here. Um, I'm going to try to get used to the incredible rise of this room. <laughs> um, and it, is, it was exciting to hear from Eric sort of the array of speakers that you guys have had before. They are a bunch of people who have really influenced my own thinking and who I feel in deep conversation with. So it was exciting to see that like Tisa Bryant had been through and Juliana and Miranda um, and some of the people who you yourselves are lucky enough to have as teachers like Naima Lowe, et cetera, that there is a lot of resonance um, and I have grown a lot as a thinker and as a writer by being um, part of a constellation of conversations that those people all participate in. Um, and I was gonna, uh, read to you, share with you some things from two different projects today and then open it up for a conversation. I'm going to try and also talk a little bit about those projects as well as sharing from them. Um, the first is from Exclosures, uh, the text that Eric was talking about that just came out in May. Um, that's a, it's a book length work that's like a serial poem. So there's a whole, it's exclosure after exclosure after exclosure. They're sort of a numbered series. Um, and then secondarily, this piece that's very much in progress on surveillance, so kind of thoughts, feedback on that one at the end is very much welcome. It probably will not ultimately have the form that it has right now um, in which I'm sharing it with you, um, but I just wanted to give you a sort of sense of the scope of what it's trying to tackle or think about. Um, I'm going to ask for a, a kind of experiment uh, with your participation for the exclosures one. Um, some of the exclosures as they're written uh, work in an unusual manner where they have these bracketed sections that are meant to sort of be replaceable um, and, ha and act as if they're in a different voice. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to sort of be the different voice to help me kind of read those sections. And I'll show you when we get to it how that will work and we can try a practice run of it. Um, but I think it will give you a sense of some of how it was trying to imagine itself voiced um, in a way that doesn't work if it's just me alone reading them. Um, but first I'm gonna give you a little bit from the beginning. Um, so uh, this was a series that I worked on across probably two, three, four years um, to put together. Um, it looked really different at the beginning than it looks now on the page. Um, and I kind of struggled to find a capsule for all of the things that it was sort of taking on. It is indeed a lot about prisons, about mass incarceration, but it's really trying to explore or take on the concepts of sort of state regimes of power as we encounter them in a whole bunch of different kinds of forms in our own daily lives as well as the more amplified ways um, that someone who is directly sort of held by the state um, encounters it. It starts with this epigraph, which I'm gonna read um, from this uh, artist, Lani Ding, who was a very important mentor in my life when I was in my early 20s, et cetera. Um, she just uh, passed away two years ago, but she was an Asian American filmmaker who made a ton of films about the Asian American civil rights struggle um, and had to make some really interesting choices in the course of making those films. A lot of the things were about uh, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, Chinese labor on those, and she had no firsthand documents 
in the voices of those who were laboring, which she could use. So she, in many ways, she had to use art to give presence and voice to those and make some very interesting experimental choices by necessity and not only by aesthetics. Um, but this passage from her is, begins the collection as it, and is sort of important to me as a framer of it. So these are the words of Lonnie Ding. Um, and she says, everyone wants a human life and a connected life where they struggle not only for themselves, but for others with whom they are kin. And that kinship can cross many lines. It's not always a kinship of blood or village. It's more than that. It can be a kinship of identification with others' struggles. That can always happen, and it has always happened. Um, so again, this very nice sort of both present tense, past tense, future as the way in which what a kinship can look like. Um, this uh, piece also closes with a long prose essay, and I'm gonna both begin and end with some very short excerpts from that. Um, so this is from the back. Nearly half a dozen years ago now, in the course of first encountering California political prisoner George Jackson's autobiographical document, Blood in My Eye, I came across two passages whose close proximity to one another seemed to me to reveal a great deal in their vibrant and eerie juxtaposition. The frictive space that hovered between them in turn spoke mountains concerning the difficult life project of navigating a recognizably multifaceted, flexible, surprising, and infinitely interpretable human panorama that wrestles forever alongside the simultaneous reality of an equally recognizable, often terrifyingly so, horizon of wretchedly predictable displays and rigid distributions of unidirectional force. In the words of George Jackson, so these are now these two passages. Passage one, the present due to its staggering complexities is almost as conjectural as the past. Passage two, anyone who can pass the civil service examination today can kill me tomorrow. Anyone who passed the civil service examination yesterday can kill me today with complete impunity. End of him. And kill him they did with simple outright brutality. And kill him, they didn't, given that with staggering complexity and fortitude, the propulsive ideas of Jackson quickly spread to nearly every prison and city in the nation. Jackson's position in all its unenviable intensity thus bears clear witness to the ongoing struggle to devise strategies for surviving and for writing that are guided by a permanent active negotiation between on the one hand, the intricate and dimensional histories of overlap and cross-pollination which inflect our every encounter and circumstance, as well as on the other hand, the crushingly straightforward one-sided, stripped down, confrontations and aggressions which it is the nature of power to produce in just as hourly increments. Um, so I think you can think of what the exposures that are to follow as trying to navigate between those two very different conditions of a complex and layered landscape of relationships and an unbreakable experience of power <laughs> um, from the state. So um, now I'm gonna try use So bear with me for one second while we... I do, but can you can we make this back in the slideshow? Somehow reverted to. <laughs> Great, thank you guys. We're gonna move, this has already become participatory. See, no, yeah. <laughs> um, So I'm gonna just, these are gonna happen the way that, what I'm hoping, so maybe we can try one. The black is what I'm gonna read. These uh, parts that are in red are meant to sort of like happen as a kind of, any one of these could fit in its place. So, and they occur as a downward list. So I would say this form of, and then I'm hoping people will just pop out in however chaotic or popcorn style to say each one of these and I'm gonna wait till they happen. So use your loud voice 
try it out, don't be shy. Um, and this is, again, just so you can get a sense of sort of how the mechanism of it is working. Um, the whole thing won't be like this. These have, just a few of them happen throughout. Other pages don't work like this, but I thought it would be a way to try this. Um, so exclosure number four. This form of... <laughs> was now recognized by some as a specific war tactic, when before it was thought of only as Can we try that one more time where we try to just do not all at once so you can hear them a little bit distinctly? Again, we'll try an experiment. So if one, per wait till home alarm system happens, someone else say the next one. This form of home alarm oh, system. Looking for viable candidates. Taxonomical fetishization. Citywide market. Well, that's the way we want to do it. Great, thanks. This is our. <laughs> so, was now recognized by some as a specific war tactic, when before it was thought of only as. A necessary movement towards order. One inevitable inconvenience of life among society. A safety measure. Reasonable precaution. Great. There were certain people who found themselves feeling increasingly preoccupied by the fact of having been occupied. Well, other people were finding their occupations to feel as if a colonization of their very own beings each act in its keeping leading to a toxically corrupting, if variable, takeover of the already harried prospect of what it means to spend one's day or to be spent by it, to quietly find oneself flat out spent. Exclusion number 11. The admonition to learn our limitations was everywhere emblazoned as the single most indelible motif that we might need take heed of should we indeed wish to succeed in our future doings. I.e., in the 1960s they learned their limitations. In the 1970s they learned their limitations. In the 1980s the same, in the 1990s more so. We live today in the diminished afterglows of a near total disappearance of prior tumultuous turfs, paraded before us now as if completely unmurky, as if an otherworldly site of airtight ideological inheritances, an unquestionable bequest whose contents were positioned and repositioned until supposedly the only hypothesis that could be gathered in synopsis was the rather impossible mandate of a world historical regulation not to reach not to stretch, not to spread, not to upend. Be it merely a small red rim teacup at supper time or the entire soot grime skyline. We were bred to believe that even trying to make our own lives worth occupying was the very height of rudeness or imprudence. We were minced into pieces and then recast as the involuntary navigators of an unworkably narrow map which arrived in our laps in the guise of an etiquette manual a semi-annual behavioral soundtrack crackling away, stuck on loop, haywire. Having reached the limits of recuperation, having graded harshly against the question of what it was she wanted to recoup, having first cooped herself up within the minuscule range of choices provided and then belabored those same joists endlessly, painfully, but without extension, the person tried earnestly now to ask herself, Am I in my own life instigating punishment to myself and to those around me? Rather than seeking rectification for our dynamics or solutions to our confusions. Am I in my own life delegating away my very livelihood to the state? Am I fated to do so? Are these the dynamics that if undone could undo prisons, could undo derision, could undo imperialism? This obscene tension of scale, which the person variously tried to inhale or paled in the face of, was everywhere in the scenes around her. She felt, if only blurrily, the necessity to boil it down, without, however, making too smooth an oil of it. She felt like, shit, what I need to do is to evolve my paranoias, not to dissolve them. Exposure number nine. And here, we're going to try it again. Ready? 
V. does not have a monopoly on exclusionary logics. Its territory is fogged in the overlap, both mingled in and repartitioned amid the trap housings of others. A new parapet or palisade, a fading rampart, a bulwark, another workplace checkpoint, an impassable berm, a drug-sniffing vermin squad, an emerging prison hulk, the bulky and overarching chambers of angled steel lattice, I was treated very nicely, he said, accepting that I was in a state of perfect terror. What to make of the fanfare over crowd movement pattern recognition? What of a reef of bombs? Its geographic relief, a natural sheathing of ersatz habitat used exclusively by military hacks for waste munitions disposal, for blowing up ordnance in an oval of oceanic proportions. Today, as the Bering Strait is melting, it opens up new areas of the Northwest Passage, allowing for ever greater volumes of long distance transcontinental shipping. It melts in significant part because of the arc of ever greater volumes of long distance transcontinental shipping. We grip wildly at this by destruction securing our mounting permissions. The deluge we wished for is kicked to the floor tortured into further accommodations. Exclosure number 17. What we might ask is fighting age in an age of fighting, and who indeed qualifies for the opportunity to reach it, as if convening with a proper chronological mobilization or elected calendar destination, and not as having simply arrived there by having simply arrived at all. Yoked in smoke, a thick congregation of unwilling tutors arrive late, arrive inebriated, yet still catering to a broader order of border murder. What other girders might we usher in to support a palpable community acutely tuned to itself in its permanent tension with the existent? in its soft tapping against the unremitting rigid distance of logics whose project it is to fence the persistent, the resistant, or the wily. The inflexible reign of a chain of ordering documents that need only state or feign one thing in order to erase another. How then to rediscover? Exposure number 12. You ready? <laughs> Come on, I, exclusive 12. Come on, I said, we haven't got all day. There is a war. Midterm election. Financial meltdown. Title ship competition. On. After a long and pregnant pause, she replied, but I am not in the war. Midterm election. I am already broken, she had it. I am already broke. Something else is already on. Something else is stirring. The kind of worrisome therapy to which various simulational psychologists subscribed themselves when they spoke to her was unmistakably narrative in nature. It cited the acquisition of maturity or the sure signs of strong mental health solely within the stealth capacity to get over or beyond the emotionality of one's affairs. They stare at me as I speak, she said. They stare because they are rarefied enough to believe that if one truly perceives that one can tell the story and not bleed, then one is no longer feeble in this region. Then one is cured, even. The woman herself found this proposition profoundly alluring, but she did not find it mooring, never mind the far more selective designation of restorative. Is recognition of not bleeding enough, she said, is that even roughly what I need to know in this scenario? To slowly and orally repeat the traumas until I don't treat them any longer as a wound, but rather only as a dead zone, as a lonely and isolated area of numbness. The woman further confessed, 
I know that I am not bleeding. Bleeding is the least of my reasons for dismay. Indeed, bleeding may be the easiest malfunction that I could dare to conceive of. The almost lovely straightforwardness with which once unleashed, its threadness pours forth in sheaves. And I'm going to do just two more of these. Exclusure number 19. From rural New Mexico, a privately contracted aerial staging ground reports back on its protracted rounds of bombardment training. They sustain a damage log, which manages through the vantage of protective goggles to record the following incidents. Results one, no barrage. Results two, part of a mine barrage. Results three, a bit of barraging. One hit to the left quarters. Results four, might have been barraged. Results five, heavy barraging, several garages totaled. Results six, Scrotal damage, barraged by wood splints. Results seven, zero barrage. Results eight, all data ravaged. Lost a hat, lost it. Results nine, glimpsed the barrager, limp barraging. Results 10, more and more barrage ensued, two wounded. Results 11, full view of barrager, the blue shoes, the nosebleeds. Results 12, beastly barraging, easterly in orientation. No matter how thin you made yourself, no matter how hard you tried to relax, no matter how undercommon was your ideological axis or how winsome the praxis of your resistance, regardless of how overstood and irrespective of the consequences, you nonetheless too often found yourself locked in sequence with the arrangement itself, which changed your orientation or more unfortunately became it. Upon encountering all the usual modes of admonition, exhortation, and discipline, we lined up. Despite the supple diversity of our gradations of non-cooperation encounter, we could mount our opposition only so far on each given day provided we were to stay living, alive in the scheme of things. Results 13, barraged until ringing, until pitted to fit, cratered with holes. And this is the very last one, exclusure, or the last one that I'll read, exclusure 15, and it also asks for you. Um, emblems aside, every individual will, at some moment, and to some unnamed and unforeseeable degree, discreetly resign or ambiguously redefine themselves in order to decrease or to avoid the risk of seemingly creasing of the pants, <laughs> exhaustion, toxic exposure, having to apologize, This capitulative vein of tempered retraining, this at some level auto gainsaying, is not in the least the same as at every level. It never the devil is. The resistance moves elsewhere. It flares, it waves, it brays. Else we go crazy in the face of our own restraints. The mother who says, don't take my son, is potentially a friend, a daughter, a sibling, a father, an uncle, a semen donor, a semen, a stewardess. The father who cries out, don't rape my daughter, is potentially a husband, a granddad, a niece, a sister-in-law, a lawbreaker, a cake decorator, a traitor. His daughter, in turn, is a bona fide otter. She's everywhere, a feral, if tottering, potency of terrible agilities. Her cagey lack of fidelity before all the boundaries that she's been given is the best smidgen of radical hope that we've got to our lot. She's a polyglot. 
She knows it's impossible, and so she tries to make do with everything. She tries to make everything do. Great. So that's just a little sense. <laughs> thanks, and thanks for helping with that. Um, so hopefully you can sort of see why those want to be in another voice, that they have this kind of sense of like replaceability and a kind of role to them, and that there's a sense hopefully for the reader that their other content could go there in addition to the ones that's there, that that's an array, but it's also like replaceable. Um, I thought before showing you some stuff from the other project, I would also just read this really short prose passage that speaks to sort of some of what I thought the Exclosure series was trying to tackle. Um, so I'm just gonna read you a very short um, prose passage by way of closing um, and then moving into the next piece. In some ways, it also represents the sort of bleed over of what the next piece then tried to like re-enter. Um, so it goes like this. These days I take as a key tenant the observation of Elisam Escobar, a visual artist and former Puerto Rican political prisoner that, so this is Escobar, the political aspect of art is to confront all of reality without ideological permissions and through its own means. In the wake of that assertion, however, another set of questions still remains lively and open to investigation, i.e., how can we create and sustain a healthy exploratory poetics in these terms? How do we insist on keeping our practices risky in ways that actually nurture us as a community? Cultivating and supporting an ample, untamped dedication to reciprocity and its extension. What does it mean for so many of us to be at sea in these, quote, liquid times, well, next to entirely without liquid assets? In lieu of that access to material property or security, what other kind of assets might we seek to build or restore among ourselves, and how much richer by far might we be for that outcome? What happens if we very seriously and daily seek to hold our very preservation as a commons? rather than as an individual stake. How does that change our lifestyles, our daily rituals, our tax files, and our writing practices? If, as the inimitable James Baldwin expresses, we have to, in every generation, every five minutes, make human life possible, what is that human life possible making poetic? In order to extend these inquiries still further into the day-to-day -day political acts, organizing practices, and social transactions of our messy, quotidian lives, might we also not be required to ask, how do we acknowledge the very real and often effective survival tactics that so many people have painstakingly developed in order to live through the circumstances in which they find our, themselves? The circumstances in which we find ourselves while also retaining the analysis and self-reflection necessary to recognize that these very same strategies, constructed in response to targeted neglect and violent attack alike, might not always be serving us so well in our efforts to create alternatives to those oppressive mechanisms. Having worked so hard in so many cases to build up these psychological and physical self-preservation shields, how can we now be brave enough across diverse communities to lower them in the name of making something different? Is bravery even what is called for? Perhaps more aptly, we must be asking, what collective infrastructures or bases of solidarity will be required within and across our various neighborhoods and kinship networks in order to optimize the feasibility of taking such chances and of being mutually vulnerable in such ways? How can we forge these sites of cohesion while at the same time maintaining an acute awareness and analysis of just how unevenly distributed all prior states of precarity have been to date? How can we freely evaluate together precisely what we can afford to do or lose while simultaneously making room for the ongoing presence of incommensurable answers? Just the other week, while caught up in a heated internal debate prodded by these very questions, I found myself rereading certain portions of a rap on race, 
a book which contains the unedited transcripts of a three-day-long conversation that took place between James Baldwin and Margaret Mead in 1970. It's a totally amazing book if you've never looked at it. Like, um, the fact that it is just really like 17 hours of conversation back and forth between these two individuals trying to re revisit, revisit, and thresh through their points of both um, cohesion and disagreement with one another. But on the morning of their final day in one another's company, the following exchange occurs. So these are their voices. This is Bald Baldwin. A great deal of what I say is based on an assumption which I hold and don't always state. You know my fury about people is based precisely on the fact that I consider them to be responsible, moral creatures who so often do not act that way. What I am demanding of other people is what I am demanding of myself. Mead. Yes, but I think you have to expand it to realize that there are things happening on both sides of the lines that are being drawn. Baldwin. Oh, I know that. I have watched it. I have lived too long and too hard a life and been saved by too many improbable people not to realize that. Despite my own multiple encounters with this text, Baldwin's use of the, that phrase, improbable people, never fails to move me to goosebumps, to haunt my mind with a certain daunting kind of electrical charge and hardworking optimism. It reminds me once again that one of the long-term aims of all of our efforts, artistic and activist alike, must be to constantly try to exponentially multiply the number of improbable people who exist in this world, ourselves profoundly included. Improbable caring, improbable alliances, improbable knowledges, improbable kinships, improbable poetics, improbable struggles, improbable couples and quintuples, improbable victories. To pursue the cultivation of whole communities of individuals who are constantly breaking new ground within and beyond the terrains of what has been predicted both for them and of them, both for us and of us. So hopefully that just, is a little mix of like a sense of kind of using that Baldwin phrase to try to think about like what an improbable artistic practice could look like and what it might open up in a realm both of aesthetics and kind of politics and so as a means to think through. Um, the second thing that I wanted to show you guys um, a bit of, and I'm just gonna do like three, cause I want to leave space for conversation and yourselves. Um, I have been trying to work on this um, long kind of poetic essay Right now, also a little bit of like a slideshow. It works a bunch with images um, that has the working title right now of Microfiche, Microfilch, Micromanage, Microfane, a series of reflections on the experience of surveillance and resistance. Um, so again, sort of if you think about sort of jo George Jackson quote that um, this thing began with both like encountering ways that people find um, means around, beyond, below um, what's positive before them and means that they are very much subject um, to conditions of power. Um, that in some ways this is trying to do some of that same investigation but through the lens specifically of surveillance, what, it, what that kind of oversight looks like and feels like and how people have tried to find um, strategies around or maneuvers within it or ways to utilize it as counter power in addition to as a mechanism of power. Um, and I think I'll just show you three of these sort of briefly so you can get a sense. It also is sort of a serial piece, so it moves as a series of reflections and allows itself to take leaps between. Some of the examples are historical and some of them are very much contemporary. And a number of them are also looking at other works, other sort of artists who are taking up or investigating um, this very concept. And I'm not gonna switch, did I leave a blank in between? Yeah, great. Um, so this is reflection number one, whose safety and how. In the September 2013 issue of Harper's Magazine, it was noted that the number of Americans who have, quote, top secret security clearance is currently roughly 1,400,000. Elsewhere, artist and geographer Trevor Paglin has observed that, this is his voice, approximately four million people in the United States hold security clearances to work on classified projects in the black world. 
By way of contrast, the federal government employs approximately 1.8 million civilians in the white world. Uh, that's the end of his quote. Um, he's using black and white there in the way of black as in the invisible economy, right? Like a sort of military economy that is covert as opposed to overt. Um, so, and then this, sometimes security is a high rolling, ill-advised, pseudo glamorous and dangerous gig. Other times, security is a middling and mind-numbing middle-class job operating on the averagest of salaries. And with still far greater frequency, security scarcely even pays the rent or lends one the financial collateral for a monthly Adderall prescription or shoes for the children. In their latest collaborative performance project, the Bay Area-based artists Cassie Thornton and Byron Peters have taken up the task of scrutinizing the occupation of security in its many contemporary and historical guises, asking probing questions concerning just who or what is protected in such roles, and more optimistically, what a complete rollover into an alternate theory or vision of protection could look like. Thornton and Peters call their project the Poets Security Force. And in their words, PSF is a mutual aid society that invites security guards to define what they would like to protect outside of other people's property and encourages them to, quote, write property while at their, what, sorry, write poetry, not your property, write poetry <laughs> while at their job. Use the report as a creative project protect on behalf of all people, even when only assigned to protect the interests of a few. Act vulnerably, represent their own complexity. Um, so last summer I went up to sort of participate in one of these workshops that they were conducting around that as the Poet Security Force. And they are, they um, advertise these as Craigslist positions that were paid by the hour under security. Um, so it was a temp security job, but in which a very, very different kind of thing happened, which is that a group of people got together for a kind of frank conversation that they would not otherwise probably have a forum to participate in, where they were asked to answer all these questions about sort of what do you protect? What are you actually protecting? What would, you, what in your own life would you, would you care about to do such a thing? How would you go about doing it? Very often, of course, those answers did not match one another. So I'm going to give you a little. The application form for a poet's force position, as posted under the online temporary employment category on Craigslist, includes the questions: <laughs> How did you learn to be a poet or security guard? What do you think security is? How do you make yourself feel secure? What do you do to make others feel secure? What do you value most in your life in the city of your residence? How would you or do you go about protecting it? Um, the answers to these questions are often fitfully impossible to synthesize or to bring into accord. In the day-long workshops which accompany these experiments, participant workers are asked to describe what are you hired to protect in your work ostensibly? What are you really protecting? The answers to these questions are often unpredictable and riveting. In fact, I was surprised to find myself replying. As an adjunct professor at a private university, I protect students from the reality of my own precarity and of theirs. I protect the illusion that institutional education is still in its majority a liberatory experience and a sustainable one. I falsely present myself as a sustained being. There are strong reasons for doubt and disbelief and I cover up that doubt hourly. I flout a confidence which I wrench forth from the air alone and contrary to all counter indications. Another woman present in the workshop slowly describes her job to those of us who are seated around the table. This is her. I work in events security, concert halls, stadiums, auditoriums, and large outdoor venues. I generally work entry. Our task is to collect the cell phones of ticket holders as they enter into big name celebrity shows. We do so in order to prevent bootleg filming or audio recording from taking place in an attempt to curb the black market availability of such items. It's chaotic and it's stressful because as you can imagine, no one wants to give up their phones. 
We just throw the phones into huge bins equipped with a dismal tagging system. As for us, the security staff, we are required to sign a waiver as a stipulation for receiving the job at all, which says that we grant full permission to the management company to use our own images to any end which they desire, at any time. Our signature qualifies as permanent consent, howsoever and wheresoever these images might appear. Failure to sign this form is cause for immediate termination of the position. The pay is $7.25 an hour. Can we call these phototoxic conditions? I.e., occupationally speaking, it looked like what you needed and then it needled you. The facilitators proceed to ask us, what are you afraid to lose? And we fill the whiteboard with replies. There isn't enough room for the magnitude of our outlying fears and concerns. This is what cannot be insured against. This is what eludes the capacity to compensate one for one's losses. In her unorthodox poetic text on drone operations and long distance warfare, author Catherine Taylor writes, so this is a, a kind of a long passage from Catherine Taylor. We long for autonomy from danger. And in order to gain this, we cede our agency to others who will stand in our place whether they are human soldiers or autonomous weapon systems. Inevitably, the desire for safety creates new dangers. It can be tempting to protect our security at any cost, but the cost of security can remake us. It can turn justified acts of defense into preemptive acts of tyranny. It can transform defenders into predators. We turn from the drone named Global Observer to the one we call the Predator. We turn from the sentinel, heron, and Hermes to the hunter, avenger, and reaper. We watch them perform in scenes of declared combat like Afghanistan, and then watch them restage in undeclared ones like Pakistan or Oakland, end quote, with newly enhanced properties and features, with the chance of intrusive ransacking ranking very high on the list of inevitable probabilities. Another woman teases her friend. If I had a proboscis for every time my safety was turned against me, we wouldn't have a pollination problem in the Northeast. If I had a turntable for every time my safety was turned against others, there'd be one motherfucking DJ station on every corner. <laughs> this is the very last picture. I'm gonna then move to the next session. This is just kind of interesting in that this is an amazing person who was also participating in that project, but he was coming from his other security job to come do this workshop. So you, these are the shirts that the post security force made, but you can see there's actually two layers of security shirts that he's wearing at that moment because he's taking a break from <coughs> one security job, going to this, we'll remove this shirt and go back to the other. Um, his story was super moving. I'll just do like one tiny sentence of tangent in that he does, um, residential security um, and in the Red Hook neighborhood in New, York, in New York City, which when all the various storm stuff had happened, he was just talking about it was the first time in his job where he could actually perform something. They were given leeway to then help people carry things up the stairs, help them re, um, for older folks who couldn't ha were on oxygen, all these various things, actual things that felt like protecting the safety, the livelihood, the welfare of those who are in there. Um, very immediately before even that situation was in any way rectified or even all the electricity was back on, they were then precluded from continuing to perform those kind of labors, right? And had to replace themselves in a condition of security that felt very much not for the well-being of the inhabitants of that neighborhood and community. So he was just really talking about how this very, very brief window in this emergency situation where protocol went otherwise and he actually felt for an instance like he was performing the kind of protection that he imagined into himself that his community deserved and could inhabit. That was unlawful by his job a mere 40 hours later, um, and one could be docked from one's play for then performing the same exact things. Um, so that project that, that Cassie Thornton is doing, I think, is really kind of exciting and sort of opening up those questions of like, what is safety, what is protection, what do we as people, um, what are we uh, required to protect? What would we actually protect given a different set of choices? Um, 
this next, so reflection um, number two. This is very different. This one is a historical example, um, and it's called mugshot movements. Will the presence and apparatuses of everyday surveillance have unquestionably expanded in scope in our own moment and in the wake of the so-called global war on terror? These are neither entirely new forms of state and corporate invasiveness, nor unprecedented efforts at resistance to those forms. When precincts, courtrooms, wards, and prisons first started taking mugshots of individuals for policing purposes, the state of photographic technology was such that each print still required a somewhat lengthy exposure time in order for the image to be successfully and crisply captured. Hence, a subject who is alternately and energetically moving about left behind on each visual slide a negative imprint of ghostly, indeterminate anatomical trails, of multiple flailing and semi-transparent cross-contaminating body parts, of facial cartwheels and the soft trickery of maverick lips, a tipping point at which mobility could confer illegibility, or at a minimum, a register of movement only. So this, the previous one is someone actually, you can tell being restricted from doing that, but when people were not being so, right, if they moved energetically while the photo was being to taken, their representation was not the one that the police system or the prison system wanted, right, but was rather these kinds of things that we're familiar with that leave these kind of blurry traces, right, of their facial features instead. Um, and this identificatory loss of grip was something that could be worked to one's quick advantage if accurate inscription was not something that one was looking to voluntarily provide in the circumstances, at least certainly not in the idle guise of proof or justification for the forceful implementation of further constraints to one's being. Instead, conceding to yield to authorities a suitable paper icon of oneself became a singular favor that one could physically refuse to bestow via the purportedly ignoble galvanization of exuberant thrashing, via the elastic implementation of amplified brow and mouth contortions, via the unrepentant tantrums of one's limbs, their nimble and kaleidoscopic spasms of gesture. In reference to the persecuted, the definition of discourteous is almost always equivalent to self-preserving, to curve and buck the torso, until what you became on film was something filmy, something intrepid, orbital, blotched, abnegated, to decline to hold one's head in appropriate, vagrant alignment to play host to one disdainful cranial shit fit after another in order to insistently be blur, to be smear, so as to avoid the perpetual smear campaign that accompanied penal classification, to remain unpersuaded by repeated enjoinments to graciously join the process of one's own adjudication. In response to such mendacious overtures on the part of the captured, the presiding overseers subsequently tried to elide any prospects of acrobatic technical sabotage through the use of such interventions as the introduction of metal forceps to station the head, the gratuitous lending forth of leather straps and rigid iron clasps to master up preferred photographic postures, the clasping of a guard's hands around the animate neck of each and every detained person, the urgent commanding guide from behind who requires of his subject a dejectedly compromised but upright demeanor, the lord of the manor and of the mannerism who mandates stillness for the sake of a criminalizing likeness regardless of whether the one so violently nested in those cupped palms likes it or not, liked it or not. A hot war over representation fought before the untoward and cold impatience of the camera lens. It's well-penned and pinning documentations. They stood ranged, arranged, wide-weighed and strong-greaved in metal sleeves 
truncated to mere trunks in profile, filed before a sinecure, a circular aperture, a sure matter of record, a muscular impression, a bent joint, a joist cavity, an all too moist exposure a rogue composition whose subject was nonetheless still capable of rejecting its frames. Sometimes the gamest foil you need is your very own body in recoil. Sometimes simply by whispering, an uncooperative or indecorous voice can go blissfully undetected by even the choices of systems. Um, and then I'm going to skip this one section that I was going to do. And I'm doing, thanks. <laughs> um, and I'm going to just... So ignore these pictures. They're related to another section you're not going to hear. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to close with this very, very last one and then open it up to yourselves. So this is reflection number five. Again, these are just sort of a smattering and they're not in the order or sequence that they actually appear in there. It does alternate kind of back and forth between historical and contemporary, so it doesn't move chronologically as a piece and is trying to create kind of cross conversation between these. Um, and this will be the very last. Um, and this is reflection number five, Cam over 2013. The social anthropologist Philippe Bourgo has noted that in many ways, the experience of consistent systematic surveillance is a class privilege. Whereas elsewhere and for everyone else, the phenomenon is encountered more as a dragnet, an unfettered barrage of gaudy but arbitrary enforcement, sweeping its erratic tracks across the city streets targeting people via spontaneous displays of both deeply ingrained historical prejudice and present tense political gainsaying. For Bergot's own current fieldwork, which studies the culture of addiction, drug sales, and small time dealers in North Philadelphia, he often accompanies his case studies, and those are his words, for years running as they go about their daily lives and business and in the course of doing so are routinely harassed and apprehended by those forces of the state that frequently await their curbside appearances and transactions. In 2008, a gathering of Borgo and five Latino men from Kensington was abruptly interrupted when police violently threw them all to the sidewalk, kicking, searching, and citing them. Only Borgo was able to ultimately fight the charges. He leveraged his at-large Ivy League and heavily endowed university, the University of Pennsylvania, to perform independent, friendly DNA tests and background checks in his own favor at a cost of thousands upon thousands of dollars. With the help of his white collar status, he had himself professionally cross-surveilled in order to produce an officially legitimated, self-exonerating counter record whereas everyone else was compelled to plea bargain and was left with significant criminal imprints, even if and when they avoided jail time. In other words, they lacked the requisite class status that was required in order to bring forensics to their own aid. They were baited and then found that they couldn't, in turn, rise to the occasion to abate the tendencies of their own pervasive demonization by others. They simply couldn't derudder the laser-like attention drawn to incriminating details only. To monitor, to disrupt, to neutralize. First, they were counted twice, and then no one could be troubled in the slightest to acknowledge them. First, they were meticulously censused, and then they were outright censored, or we are doubled down upon loudly in those incipient moments where involuntary forced speech is a mandate, and then once more upon the hardcore imposition of long-term penetrating silence. The more the word safe is repeated, the worse our worries become. In February of 2013, a participatory game of public interference with the optical regime of the state was anonymously instigated in Berlin, Germany. Its organizers publicized, so this is from them themselves, the idea of cam over is to destroy as many CCTV cams as possible, and for this we decided to announce a competition." End quote. It was an open public invitation. 
In order to join this dynamic and ever-shifting live action game, all one needed was a group with a name that started with command, brigade, cell, or platoon, and ended with a historic person. Points were awarded for the most creative, destructive acts, and multiple videos of said maneuvers went viral. Platoon Huey Newton, the Judith Butler Brigade, the Society of the Spectacle Cell, Command Los Indignados. Interestingly, in this imaginative effort to knock out surveillance pieces and encourage others to do the same, the whole game-like structure was built around and depended upon filming oneself while doing so. And further still, upon subsequently posting those videos of sabotage for boastworthy public consumption on a widely available and heavily trafficked online site. In other words, as a concept, it was high, tightly reliant upon the scrupulous documentation of one's own most self-incriminating behaviors. Offering the lingering question of, to what extent does this disruption leave the central model and its dynamics intact, even as it destroys discrete mechanisms? The cam over game ended on February 19, 2013 the day when the European Police Congress was held in Berlin. It served as a precursor to a continental amassing of legions of badge holders, who were at the very least now beholden to confront the people's disgust and distrust at their arrival. But what are we to make of Camover's choices to take up this specific language, that of masculinized militarization, the Che Brigade, and that specific use of the post-production media propagation of one's transgressions. I ask this now because I'm actually not sure. I think it's useful to position all those hundreds of thousands of public but hidden cameras as seen, and even more importantly, as destroyable. I think it's useful to be playful and not to always hide one's inevitable contradictions. I think that's powerful even. And yet I'm also reminded of Brecht's line in the trial of Lucullus where the courtesan commiserates. It's him. Our lot is the same. For me too, prodigious Rome could not protect from prodigious Rome. Or of the graceful recognition of deep and difficult internalizations about which James Baldwin utters. This is his words. In a society much given to smashing taboos without thereby managing to be li liberated from them, it will be no easy matter. I'm going to say that one again because it seems like a great way to close. In a society much given to smashing taboos without thereby managing to be liberated from them, it will be no easy matter. It will take more than episodic scattering or temporary blackout. I'm going to close up. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to try and turn this back on. We'll see if I can see. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so thanks, you guys. I don't know how this second part usually goes. I wanted to sort of, I mean, so open it up to Q&A, but I don't know if there's a mic that goes around or yeah. If there are any questions, this would be a good time to ask them with Emily. And if you're in the way back, you know, to wave your hand so she can see you and then sing out so the rest of us can hear you. You want. That's great. And, there's, and then get, let's get the, the walk around mic. So Awesome. Uh, I was really moved by the uh, kind of just shift in the idea of security that that your your presentation gave me, and I was just wondering, what makes you feel secure within our society? Um, I think so. This is the part where sort of like my artistic practice and like what 
the ways in which one might try to incarnate that as a kind of daily lived life. Like the work that I do, organizing work around decarcerate PA, is really trying to tr trouble through that set of questions um, and to think about that where that mass incarceration as this phenomenon exists that we're trying to dismantle and we're not trying to replace it with another mass institutional structure. Um, so, so the platform of that group has really like has this like threefold thing that is sort of a demand around no new prisons, like a very practical physical structural one. We should stop building these, right? Um, and that we try to be very much included in that, like this notion of also detention centers around immigration. That there are these other kinds of imprisonment that are happening that are equivalent. Um, but then the second one is around is a demand around what decarceration would look like, and it's really about like sending people home, like not just not building these new ones but figuring out that tons of people are in there for, for addiction things some of the people are in there for poverty things some of the people are in there for acts of violence but that were um, the conditions that created them are remediable and they're not intrinsically quote unquote violent people um, and so that there are that we can imagine solutions to that that the prison system itself is not actually posing in any way shape or form whatsoever and that if we actually inhabited the idea, not even just of restorative justice, which is certainly an improvement, but often leaves someone just restoring someone to the very spot from which they were in a desperate spot anyway. Um, but these notion of transformative justice, that like what would it mean to actually change the conditions so that people collectively could make different choices than what they do. And the last one of that platform always tries to be reinvestment, that like we actually can tell you where else this money should go. We're not at a loss for like the ideas of like how that could happen. And we can name all of these things that have been gutted and defunded, that if refunded and then even differently funded above and beyond the paltry things that pre-existed as a social welfare network or whatever um, could would change the even need that I would say is in part illusory or invented that we have to have these institutions in the first place so I think for me that daily work um, is ha tries to rethink that. It goes, it's messy sometimes, right? Because we don't all collectively as people have all the tools available to us to let us make different choices. So like trying to incarnate transformative justice when every other mechanism around you is built punitively um, and impressively around these other things sometimes doesn't work out perfectly. Um, but I think it builds a kind of community structure that's more capable the next time than it ever was previously in terms of building Huh. All right. Did you hear that? Yep. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of like speak to that a little bit more, or like the idea of like um, the way that surveillance is like, or like this idea of like consistent surveillance versus the sort of like everyday like imposed fixtures of surveillance. Yeah, I definitely can. That specific phrase is from Burgo. So oh, that I is see. a section that I'm like also trying to work through a bunch more, uh -huh. but it's his notion, right, that like you, um, have the luxury of knowing where and when it's going to happen to you and how. Um, oh, I see. And that like you enter these spaces, it doesn't mean that you're not subject to surveillance, right? But let's say I'm even in a more privileged position than many um, and I know what's gonna happen to me when I go to an airport, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in a certain part of West Philadelphia where I also live, it's often not happening to my body, <laughs> but mm -hmm. to many, many other bodies of color, et cetera, there is very inconsistent but pervasive dragnet stop and frisk. Right. Right, which is like, I might go to that corner one time, it will happen. I might go to it the next time, nothing will happen. The next time it might happen 20 yards ahead where I've never been sort of like stop and frisk in the past. And also I think in the example of what happened to him and those other five people is like deeply illustrative of mm -hmm. when can you can you ever leverage surveillance in your own favor? Right. Do you have the resources to sort of pr do a counter DNA test or something like that? Right. Um, so it's, it's that thing, right? That like some of us are able to elect 
when we project our, share our image. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the same maybe with that early one that was looking at the folks who work security at events, right? And mm -hmm. their job is to prohibit the proliferation of certain images at the same time they are subject to their own image being used where and how and when whatever circumstance right. it could happen as a condition of getting a wage at all. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the sort of relationship between that and this idea of like documentation around surveillance and yeah. like like the documentation around like bringing like, like the cameras down and like that connection toward with like the idea of like social media or like mm -hmm. um, data mining like with the NSA and stuff and like yeah. ways that like certain people are protected or have protection against those um, sort of surveillance strategies while others are more vulnerable to it. Or yeah, perhaps. and I think that's of a super, I mean, I bet you have a bunch of that, but like in relation to the Ferguson stuff too, right, the demand for surveillance cameras on the police cars or on police themselves so that there's documentation of what they're doing. On the one hand, that's a powerful demand. On the other hand, it's sort of, it's there's a m bit of disempowerment in it, right, in that you right. do not feel that you can actually gain accountability from any of these features or structures, mm -hmm. and so you're trying to mandate the one thing you think you might be able to like if we can't get justice maybe we can get surveillance it's right. almost like this like the recognition of that we these uh, forces act with impunity and without mm -hmm. accountability time and time again right. um, where I am in Pennsylvania there just was these uh, uh, they're, they weren't hunger strike, they were boycotts in the dining halls, um, in the prison system there, in relation to both these food cutbacks and all these egregious condition things that were happening inside the prisons there. But one of the demands similarly was the, to have the, this takes more setup than I meant to have to, uh, you, when you're in the restricted housing unit, you then, in order to ever get out of it, you have to see this board of people get a sort of quote unquote hearing. You should think of these like military hearings where there's actually no oversight of them whatsoever. And mm -hmm. like there's, you can never present sort of evidence on your behalf. No one is like accompanying you in the course of that as your lawyer or anything equivalent to that. Mm -hmm. um, but they, one of their demands around these boycotts was to have those hearings recorded. Mm -hmm. In part because those hearings are completely unaccountable, right? Um, and that's powerful that they're demanding it. It also is coming from a spot in which they're pretty hopeless about actually changing the right. nature of those hearings. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like, uh, it's a really useful one to look at in mm -hmm. terms of the matrix of possibility. Yeah. Thank you. No, thanks. Yeah, sure, sorry. Um, I'm interested in how your poetic practice and your academic practice and your constitute, collide, or depart from each other. Uh huh. And also, what's the role of mutual vulnerability has in their approach? Yeah, okay. So, should I say the question? Yeah. Um, I'm interested. She, so, this is, I'm repeating her exact question. Uh, the question was I'm interested in the role of your poetic practice and your academic practice, and then secondarily, um, what the space of, or the capacity of mutual vulnerability is in those several worlds. Um, and I, um, I mean, I think you can hear that a little bit in the adjunct part one of it, right? <laughs> um, of thinking about what are the economies even of these institutions of universities right now, and how might they also be spaces for reformulation of how we interface with one another. Um, uh, for me, also, I'm always trying to figure out like what's the relationship of my poetic work and like one's organizing or activist work. Um, and that becomes, they're deeply related, like this, neither of these two pieces would exist as they do were I not engaged in those um, grassroots movements as one was. They are slightly different in that I think the space of those grassroots movements are responding to very acute conditions at all times and kind of mandate a set of strategy and tactics that um, are responding to immediate conditions of abuse, deprivation, that um, require a kind of practicality um, that you're very much like trying to end this condition and therefore sometimes compromises in the way like how one is visiting legislators, what one is trying to argue for them, that I, that the 
poetic space is a real relief in terms of actually being able to speak in very different fashions than sometimes the political sphere demands um, for, as, a, as a strategy. Um, so for me, the site of the poetic then becomes that spot where you can really sort of sound out the full reverberations of the cost, the consequences, the landscape of what's taking place there um, without the um, very necessary mandate to sort of um, be in a, in a reactive response thing to permanent attack. Um, mutual, sh uh, mutual vulnerability, I feel like that's a big, like I really like it as a question. It's like I am trying in my life to cultivate space for that in all of the spaces that don't necessarily invite it. Um, and that's work that you do with others like not just yourself. And so I think um, that has looked like a bunch of different things and in terms of how one has tried to incarnate that in a classroom versus how one has tried to incarnate that in an organizing meeting. And I think for the, po for the artistic stuff, it is like being part of, of a larger set of conversations that are sort of informing your work. And the po doing poetic work has been very exciting in terms of opening up space. Like when this book came out, like half of the first copies that I that I got, sort of like my complimentary copies, went to inside the prisons to folks that I've been deeply collaborating with for a long, long time. And I think it's sometimes nice that you can open out. And some of that was like, because my work is strained and experimental in these various kinds of ways, it can feel a little vulnerable to like be working in this other medium and will it in any space, like sharing it here or sharing it in these other ones where that's not usually how you're talking to one another, but it has been really amazing to kind of open up and many of the folks who I constantly collaborate with are themselves writers, et cetera, on the inside. So like to have differently layer the kinds, of, the level at which we can be conversing as well as organizing together. So it's been nice. Yeah, sorry. Uh, wait. <laughs> So not to bemoan our plight or anything, but Guantanamo is still open and most yep. of the prisons are overcrowded. So I don't think the goal of not building any more prisons is gonna solve anything. I would challenge you to maybe build a prison and take in these prisoners and treat them how they're supposed to be treated to set an example. And you know, acting like that surveillance is over because all these people back in February a year ago smashed cameras or that... So I'm not acting like surveillance is over. Well, that piece wasn't trying to say that at all, actually. Okay, well, what I heard <laughs> in your presentation was that this group that meets was over. And what I'm hearing from you is that we want to stop these prisons. Uh -huh. But I don't see, as a nation, that happening. And I guess my second part of the question is, as an artist who lives under a dictator fascist kind of state, do you ever worry that your work is being used as propaganda? Can you say, can you say more about that last phrase? Propaganda in what way? I, mean, I think I don't know how to respond to it because I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. You hired a, a minimum wage worker in order to extract information That's Cassie for them. Thornton, but it's a different project, but go ahead. Yeah. So, so this is an example of, you know, you, you, you take this option to take a, a selection of society in order to express a very specific viewpoint but maybe that viewpoint can be co-opted and misinterpreted. And I wonder as an artist if you ever consider the ramifications of saying people in prisons need to be treated differently. Yeah, all the time, actually. Um, so I guess, yeah, all the time. And I, that work, uh, and my work has changed in relation to various res like responses and I have very much at different phases of it shared it for feedback and my own thinking has changed tremendously across a decade of thinking in collaboration with people. So yeah, I definitely don't have, my ideas are not static or unbendable or inflexible. I don't, I would, I would reject the proposal that I should build a prison and run it how it would. I think that when we build these things, we fill them. Um, literally some of the, like, most of these prisons are state institutions, but if you look at even some of the private prison model, they actually run on a model in which the state has to promise them that they will remain at 90% capacity, otherwise the state will pay for every vacancy in them, um, so that they, they in fact are built to be filled, um, and therefore the legislation, legislation is not a static item. Things that are crimes now were not 
prosecutable crimes 30 years ago. We have built all these mandatory minimums in on things, all these various kinds of drug laws. We've, our sentencing is the longest sentencing anywhere in the world in terms of how much time people serve for specific things. So I actually disagree. I agree that the prisons are overcrowded, but I disagree that the solution is to build more of them and spread people out so they have more space inside. I actually think we could send 40% of the people in them home immediately and we would be collectively safer um, and collectively more resourced. That these also, in addition to what's happening to the people who are in them, the communities from which these people are coming have been economically gutted um, by the expenses that it's a super tax on the poorest and least resourced communities uh, because not only have they lost all their wage earners, but there are these totally extortionist systems of commissary um, and spending and to have a phone call for 15 minutes with someone you love costs you eight dollars that you do not have because you've also lost all your wage earners that like it literally has a caustic catastrophic it is the criminal <laughs> element of how that organization has happened. So I don't want to build a good prison. I think they could be better. It'd be I would certainly like give a round of applause to someone who stopped abusing folks in, the, in them that they were doing. We have 80,000 people in solitary confinement for ranges of things. It's unbelievably expensive to hold someone in solitary confinement, like on the tune of $160,000 a year, right? So like what that money else could do to, and it's not helping that person, it's destroying them. Um, and they will, vote. most people, despite our extraordinarily long sentences, do get released. Like 90% of folks will find their way back out. We have some choices in terms of in what condition they find their way back out and what they feel like they have as interior resources and exterior ones in their communities for how they do so. And I, yeah. <laughs> Do a fast, could people hear that? No, right? Um, so it was a question, tell me if this is an inadequate summary, but it's like of what kind of national networks exist, what is Decarcerate PA doing now, who else is it connected to, and then how does one balance sort of art and activism practices in one suit? Um, and I'm gonna try to give us kind of fast answer to a number of those. Um, Decarcerate PA now has probably two campaigns that are most active. Sorry, I don't know what I, maybe I'll just turn it on. I'll leave it, whatever it's doing. <laughs> um, is um, seeking to not have this jail expansion built and that, just to speak to yours, is, is like a very complicated conversation. The jail system in Philly is, is wretchedly overcrowded. So we are having to make these sort of layered proposal that we're not just saying don't build this and let people be in conditions that are 150% over max. Um, so we really are being very, trying to be very, very careful that we're not, um, that when we're saying no new prisons, we're not just saying that and imagining that like what's happening to people and the way these facilities are now is okay. Um, or that they should be even further filled up. Um, and then, but we're also trying to launch this campaign in coalition with a number of other folks that is called the Coalition Against Death by Incarceration. In Pennsylvania, all the life sentences are life without parole. No one ever has the capacity to go before a parole board. And, the, um, so, and like 10% of the population is serving life sentences. Um, we also have, uh, I can't, I forget the term of it now. Um, the way it works, a felony murder charge, that means that if you were anywhere present on the scene 
and something happened like that, um, you can be charged with a life sentence as if. So for instance, someone who I collaborate with a bunch, a very close friend, and who I co-designed that address this project with, is serving a juvenile life sentence that he got at 16 um, for being a drug lookout on a C and it went bad. It's not like there were, nothing happened, um, but he was standing on a corner thinking what was happening was a petty drug sale and a whole bunch of other things were actually happening in there. But he's now in his, he's now 40, has been inside and has no prospect um, of ever seeing release from that. Um, and is a very, very different person. A is not in there for the things they name that he's in there for, but B also is a very different person than he was as a 16 year old. Um, so that is a campaign we're trying to do. We're trying to hook up with folks across the country that are doing, that are looking at stuff against life without parole. It would be amazing if more of a national network happened. We're, I would not say we're part of a coherent one that is like de in a regularized way. So we like collaborate with Curb in California and with CR in the, more the New York chapter than the um, California one, but that could be brought in. And in terms of the artistic and activist, it's a, yeah, I agree with you that it's a, a struggle to figure out when you're prioritizing one or the other, but I would just say that they have been deeply important critical parts of my life each of them, and so whenever I have for too long of a period only done one and let the other totally lapse or only done th that, I feel that gap and that somehow they're cross-informing one another. And again, in terms of like, who do you get to be in dialogue with and how and under what conditions? Um, that has been a um, Should I, I don't know if I should let it go over time. I'm not sure what you should do. Yeah. <laughs>